Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hello, welcome to today's webinar discussion, developing and implementing an effective DEI strategy. My name is Kim Heyer, I'm with GP Strategies, and I'm happy to be your host for today's session. So before we get started, I do just want to let everyone know that we are recording this session and we will be providing a follow-up email with a, a link to today's recorded session. So also, as you know, we always try to make this as engaging as possible and as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to contribute to today's discussion. So if you have um, any comments that you want to use during this discussion, use the chat feature and engage with our presenters, our panelists, and also all the other attendees. I do ask that if you do have any specific questions for our panel today, that you use the Q&A option, and that way we can respond during the session or at the end with time permitted. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining our ses session today, and I'm excited to introduce you to today's panel moderator. So Angela Peacock, she is the global director of DEI here at GP Strategies. She's one of the founders of PDT Global before merging the organization into GP and taking on this role. She's an advisor to boards, an executive coach, and all around expert in this space, speaking at conferences across the world, sometimes known as challenging, always practical, and oftentimes fun. She is our moderator today, and I want to welcome Angela. Angie. Thank you very, very much, Kim. Thank you for, for, for doing that. And hello to everybody out there. So pleased that you could join us today. And uh, we've got some really, really exciting stuff for you, some surprising stuff for you. Um, and I also think some some moving stuff for you, which is not maybe what you were expecting from um, a session that is really designed to look at the how to build a strategy, what to do, what not to do, what measurement should you use, what shouldn't you do, um, who should we involve, and really giving you some tips. But I have to say, I won't be doing that myself. Um, we have today with us three phenomenal um, panellists. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce them to you. Um, and they will be sharing their knowledge. Um, I'm going to introduce them one by one so that I can give them the, the build up they deserve. After that, we will be going into quite a free flowing conversation. So what I did want to just reiterate is what Kim said, please do, if there's if there's something you want to make comment about in the chat so that you can sort of keep up and get other, other people's opinions, please, please do. But actually, probably more important, if there are any specific questions that you'd like to put to the panel, pop them into the Q&A. If I don't pick them up, it's because I'm going to pick them up later. So if they're not kind of in the flow of what we're talking about, I will We'll be coming back to them later but we do want them we do value them so please do um, pop them into the Q&A we want you to be as involved as possible today so my panel um well the first panelist that I'd like to introduce you to is Juan Fernando Lopera um he has had one huge career and in common with the rest of my panelists it did not begin in DE um, it began deeply in strategy um, and deeply doing the real hard business ends. He began with Deloitte, moving to Tufts as the director of strategic analysis, and then to Blue Cross as the director of affordable strategy, which, which I would love to talk more to him about, but probably not today. During that, he moved into diversity, equity and inclusion. And frankly, listening to one, it became his life's work. He's now the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer for Beth Israel Hospitals um, over in um, the US. He's, he says that his work is about transforming care for the underserved while practically establishing a change system, which I actually think is probably all our work. It's just beautifully put and seems so real for the environment that, that he's in. 
Um, look, one has numerous civic engagements, far too many for, for me to list. But if I can just give you a couple of them. He's a founder member of the Statewide Coalition for Health Equity. He's the co-chair of the Latino Equity Fund. He's got lots more trustee um, and memberships that he, he does as well. I mean, he's currently sitting in Boston. Juan, you are very, very welcome. Nice to see you today. Thank you for, for joining us. You're welcome. For having me. <laughs> oh, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. I'm now going to move on to our second panellist, and that's Deepa, Deepa Arjan. Now, Deepa, again, she started with Goldman Sachs. So, again, deeply in the business, she started in customer relations, became an executive director in the kind of, I'm going to say, sort of hard-nosed area there. She then moved into what I think is even more hard-nosed, and that was leading change, developing strategic plans for cultural change and for DEI change um, before joining Avenard two and a half years ago. Um, if you don't know um, who what Avenard is, um, its major shareholder is Accenture. It's a pretty major player in terms of consultancy firms. Um, she joined two and a half years ago as the Director of Global Learning, Leadership and DEI. It's probably another webinar for another day in that, discussing how those three work together. Um, she quotes herself as being a friend of the old PDT and now GP strategies, which is always lovely, lovely to hear um, from a client that's worked with us for so long. Um, but I have to tell you that one of the quotes that her people make about her, which I think is, is, is really brilliant, is that she's strategic and empathetic leader and she enables others to reach beyond what even they can imagine. I don't think you can say anything fairer than that about a leader. You're very welcome with us today, Deepa. Thank you for joining us. Is she there? She's there. And last, but by no means least, um, we're also joined by somebody that those of you that have known PDT for a long time will probably recognise, and that's the then Eleanor Brett, now Eleanor Goikman Brett. L has the accolade of being the first person that when PDT Global started to do work away from strategy and culture change and into DEI, um, she joined us as a project manager we couldn't really clip her wings for too long because it didn't take long for her to move into facilitation. And then she left us and she went off to Virgin Media and then Alzheimer's and Cyclum, building their plans, building their strategies and implementing their DEI work. Um, she really does bring to this conversation a huge mix of somebody that's worked in charities, established tech and fast growing startups. Um, we were glad to have her back, though, in 2020, um, and she's now a global inclusion consultant with us. I have to warn you, she's data mad. So a lot of the data questions Elle will, I, I know, pick up. Um, if you want to upset her, you just ignore the data, and that, that seems to work a treat with her. Um, when she's not working with PDT, um, she I'm, I'm just not even fair to say it on the side of her desk. She does brilliant work. She runs a charity called Charity Culture Catalyst um, that actually develops strategic plans for charities and NGOs globally. So she brings that to us as well. Elle, thank you for joining us. You're very, very welcome. So that is my panel today. And um, I did promise um, conversations a plenty around strategy, um, and we will get to that. But I want to kick us off, panel, by asking you all individually, what moved you in to the DEI work? I, I, I've said that all three of you worked solidly in business before you moved into DEI, but what moved you into DEI work, whether that was practical, which is fine, or personal? I'd, I'd love to hear just a, a little bit from, from each of you deeper. Perhaps I can start with you, if I may. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, and I just want to say hello to you all again. My pronouns are she, her, by the way. Um, so I am um, a British Asian woman, uh, first generation uh, graduate, first generation professional. Um, a bit about me and my background. Uh, my mom was a single mom growing up and decided to become a foster carer when I was very young. And so we've had around 60 children um, coming into and out of our homes over the years. And I think that that is really what drove me into this space because I saw how systemic discrimination impacted these children and their families um, and and really wanted to do something about that and so you know the typical kind of 
Indian route would be a doctor or be in finance or be in, you know, banking or law. Um, and so I, I took that route, but very much on the side was continuing to um, support organizations that really helped with the, the progress of those underrepresented groups. And so when the opportunity arose for me to kind of merge both business and this um, really important work, uh, I jumped at the opportunity and I'm actually really glad that I've had the opportunity to be on the business side because it gives me an in into how I can influence at the yeah. business level. Really important. Sitting in HR where I am right now. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, that's brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Deepa. That's a, that's a really, really good insight. Thank you. And Elle? I'm hoping Elle's going to say she's working in DEI because we were all so fantastic. She couldn't possibly do anything else, but I think she could be not. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> um, uh, so as you all know that the, uh, when we met in 2009, I was actually working in a tax department, which doesn't seem very me now. Um, but I had done a dissertation in the unconscious bias of attractiveness. It never occurred to me that that would ever be useful. Um, until I met Angie, a chance meeting with Angie in 2009. And I really started to make that connection between, you know, the work that I'd studied and, and how that was relevant for business. And so to be honest, it was PDT that brought me into the world of DEI. And I just realized how, you know, much like Deepa said, I could combine, you know, my passion for equality and equity, um, with data, um, and, and kind of business acumen. So it really seemed the perfect world for me. Thank you very much, Al. And Juan, last yeah, well, uh, uh, thanks for having me again. And uh, hello from um, Harbor Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the U.S. Um, that's what's right behind me. Um, uh, and uh, how how I got to D into D and I officially in 2015, and we'll get more into that uh, as to sort of the business case I made for getting into D and I, but. Uh, I'd say unofficially, um, I'm just going to flash a visual here. I, I feel I got into this work uh, when the journey started for my late dad back in 1988. Oh, wow. As you see on this visual here, this is a uh, card that I kept in my wallet as a 12-year-old when uh, he left our native uh, Colombia, Medellin, Colombia, back in 1988, when things were uh, pretty rough. Uh, it's a much different country now, but things were pretty rough back then uh, due to the drug cartels, et cetera. And he left to look for a bit better future for us, as, as the note says in Spanish. And and uh, my uh, official title for him there, El Mejor Papa del Mundo, the best dad in the world. And then on the right side there, you see his uh, handwritten itinerary of his trip through Central America about two weeks back in the time when there was no WhatsApp or any way of communicating and finding out that uh, my best friend, my my dad was, um, you know, taking on this treacherous journey through Central America and crossing the Rio Grande, uh, the highlighted note there, seven hours of foot across the Rio Grande. Um, no way of finding out uh, if he made it safely. And, and he eventually did and found his way to Boston, which is where we are now. But, um, you know, I reflect on that, um, experience because it really guides the work I I have done throughout my career, whether unofficially volunteering uh, to do more for the community beyond sort of the four walls of the organization where I worked. But then officially, uh, as we'll get into, it, it did become part of my day job in 2015, roughly. Well, thank you for sharing that one. And, and I, I do think it's interesting that, you know, lived experience and the experiences that we have but in 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 what i have observed after doing this work for the last 25 years all of that is really important but if we haven't got deep strategy within the organization then actually it, it doesn't galvanize it into what it really should we kind of almost owe it back to to have the, that strategic piece done rather than the the need sometimes to just be performative, to just go out there and do stuff when it's not really tied back to anything. You know, I endlessly do say to clients that call up and say, we'd like to do some training. You know, well, where's that sitting in your strategy? Why are you doing it? Um, and I, I have to say, in all honesty, five times out of 10, they can't really 
point to anything. So um, I'm hoping we, we get into some of that today. So Juan, can I stay with you then? Because, you know, you've intimated that 2015 when you moved in. And, and I know that the strategic work you're doing at the moment, you're happy to share some a slide with us and explain exactly what that looks like. So can yeah. I can I ask you yeah. to tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, I started in consulting at Deloitte, um, spent eight years really learning the business side uh, and the strategic side of healthcare. Uh, I found um, healthcare was the industry that really uh, played to the the mission and the purpose um, that kind of ties back to that lived experience, especially as an immigrant, uh, especially as someone who didn't have health insurance for a long time due to our immigration status. I saw firsthand what it's like to not speak the language and uh, and and face the many challenges people face in uh, navigating healthcare. Um, when when you don't have health insurance when you're undocumented um so so when i got into consulting i immediately went into healthcare as the industry uh then from there i um got tired of being on the road traveling the country um and joined a health insurance company um and and got deeply immersed in healthcare financing and if there's one way to learn the business side of healthcare is uh healthcare financing is key so by as i, as I was doing that um uh, I was also continuing to volunteer externally on nonprofits and these uh, continue to be civically engaged. Um, and it wasn't until 2014 where I sort of had a light bulb moment where I said, geez, I could really blend these two passions. I can bring my business acumen and make a strong case for DEI really through that business lens. And the way I went about it um, in 2014, we had a a change in leadership happening around that time and my last employer. And I kind of had a good sense for who the key stakeholders were that I needed to engage who were likely to, uh, uh, the individual who was likely to become CEO. So I engaged mm -hmm. Tom, uh, a white male of privilege, uh, who really, I, I knew cared, cared deeply about me and cared deeply about this work. And I said, uh, I said, Tom, look, we, and, and I wrote the business case and I did all the, math uh, around that business case and the metrics where we looked at the the change in demographics within our region where we sold our products and said that we were way behind um, to the tune of 2.2 billion in top line revenue uh 270,000 customers um, worth of a gap when we looked at the region's racial and ethnic demographic compared to the customer base uh, 2.2 billion, 270,000 customers worth. And because it's healthcare and it was as health insurance, if you increase top line revenue and you address health disparities, bring down medical costs, then you have a significant margin. Yeah. And it was already part of the mission for the health plan at the time. So that, that became the compelling business case that led to sort of this journey down the DEI path and officially became a title you've never heard of. Uh, it was, um, the business diversity officer because we wanted wow. to be very intentional right. about having yeah. it very connected to the business and it reported to the ceo and we built out a di a di team um, and really uh connected with all aspects of the business uh, how we how we went to market how we uh, addre address health disparities uh, through our clinical programs uh, how we contracted through our finance, how we contracted with minority-owned, women-owned um, vendor suppliers. So kind of a comprehensive strategy that got us there. That um, then uh, opened many doors down this path of the E&I mm -hmm. and the cur current role that I'm in, I've been in for two years at a much larger organization. We have uh, 36,000 employees at this large hospital system with 14 hospitals, multiple clinical units. And I took the same approach you know really came at this through the business lens build out um, a set of capabilities um, that we are deploying across our 20 or so entities uh, established we established goals for dni across three major domains and, and this is the the slide i did want to flash um, we um, so across our system we established system goals across three major pillars our talent our workforce we knew that we had uh, significant under and continue to have significant under representation in leadership and also in clinical roles, uh, particularly nurses and physicians. So we set out a very specific aim to have at least 25% representation in new hires. 
we uh, for health equity in terms of our patients, we uh, are working on cardiometabolic um, and maternal health disparities. We found significant gaps there for particularly for our black and Hispanic patients. And then in terms of uh, economic inclusion um, mm -hmm. as a large system, we, we have significant purchasing power. So also looking at how we improve that through our supplier diversity. So we establish system goals that report up to the board of directors that um, are uh, that hold our leaders accountable because they're tied to incentive compensation. And then we cascaded these goals across our 20 entities um, by establishing a, a very specific um, set of capabilities, 17 to be exact, across those three pillars uh, that are hospitals, clinical units are working on developing. Um, so uh, so that's the, the the strategy we've established kind of dates Brilliant. back to when I started in this space in 2014 and we continue to do the work. Wow, that's bad. And, and in, in some ways, I'm going to say a gift because it's so clear what you've got to change and what you've got to do. I think the other bit that's clear is what you've got to change and the line straight through to the bottom line which gets everybody that needs to hear it, hearing it. We'll talk about stakeholders in, 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 in a little while. And then a really clear cut, this is what we're going to do in, in order to get there. I'll come back to you in a little while to say how you're doing on that. But for now, <laughs> deeper, um, slightly different for you in terms of what your strategy is going to look like, does look like, but can you just speak a little bit to, to that for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um... So we we also have three key pillars. I think three is the magic number. Um, yes. We're looking at it from a, a slightly broader perspective because our our focus is, and I know we're going to maybe touch on this later, but it's beyond race and ethnicity. We're also looking at disability. We're looking at um, gender, LGBTQ plus, and so we've kind of brought it up to a level of what we're trying to achieve in terms of representation, in terms of our culture. And then also in terms of recognition, we want our people to recognize us as leaders in inclusion, diversity and well-being, but we also want to be recognized externally. And that's where our strategy kind of really ties in with the business priorities, because we know that our business wants to um, increase brand awareness. We know our business wants to be able to reach a more uh, broad customer base. We know our business wants to innovate. And so we're, we are trying to align our strategy to the business strategy to be able to say, well, we can actually enable you. Um, you need to get on board with this. And so um, that's, you know, sorry, I'm not able to share a slide with you, but um, that's kind of uh, how we've taken an uh, approach to strategy on our side. Again, really good to hear the business case and how that's really front and center from, from looking at it both for, I'm, going to, I'm not going to say convincing senior teams because very often, and we've heard from one, they, they don't need any convincing, um, but sometimes they need convincing of the specific actions that are sitting underneath that. And I think the business yeah. case is, is absolutely critical. L, I, I hesitate to say you've been around the block with this, but I mean, you, you, you know, obviously with us, you've worked with a lot of clients and, and personally in, in your in-house roles you have. Can you speak a little bit to then, you know, when, when the, We've heard about how the business case is, is so critically important, but have there been any other ways that you've developed strategy and from any other bases? I think uh, one of the things, I mean, I, and I hear it in, in both the way that Juan and Deepa speak, is that authenticity is really important in the way that you develop your strategy. I think we live in a world where, you know, when I first started doing this, no one had heard of DNI, and now lots of people have, which is great, but it has also become a bandwagon that often senior leaders want to jump on, which is great. But if that's inauthentic, then mm. people internally and externally feel that. And likewise, I think it starts to become inauthentic when you focus too much on a specific group without the numbers. Um, you know, we saw that a lot uh, at PDT GP um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And absolutely, you know, we needed a world that focused more on um, the inequality of people of color across the world. Mm -hmm. But we needed data that showed it and we needed to be authentic about it. So I'd say that that's the key thing that I feel I'm hearing from Deeper and Juan. And, and sometimes I don't hear from all organizations yeah I, I i would say that's absolutely true and i think the frightening thing for me sometimes is when i look at an organ a client organization strategy and i know i've seen it before somewhere 
and and quite literally i swear i've seen some that have had the names tipexed out and changed and it's virtually the same thing especially if it's in the same sector and you you know you, again that that's worrying because where's the data on that because you know we, we we have to be sure about that w one thing that i didn't sort of hear from from you on that and can i can i sort of please all chime in on this when we talk about the length of time a strategy should plan for what do you think the optimum is on is there an optimum or does it depend you know please feel free any of you to take that one who wants to jump in on that one to start with uh happy to start um uh, so we we've um at least in the two iterations of this work in two organizations has mm -hmm. typically been a five-year sort of uh longer term goal um that gets established and, and yeah. then there's an annual planning process through which you then measure your uh progress towards that five-year goal five to ten year goal uh, my last job uh, i mentioned we built a business case and the new ceo came on board and you know before he came on board we had already convinced them that this needed to be one of the top priorities and it did become that and the goal that was established so this was in 2015 when he became ceo Mm. established something called vision 2020 so by t the year 2020 one of the goals was to increase the diversity of the customers by 50 percent completely picked out of the air whoa the audacious uh uh goal um but we had done some of the homework to make sure that okay. it was at least realistic um and but it's still very audacious um but we then having that uh guided everyone to get around that goal to then develop annual plans. And then sure enough, by the time I left in 21, um, we had uh, we had we had met that goal, we exceeded it. We increased the customer base, uh, the diverse customer base by uh, 51% to be exact. Wow. Uh, we had uh, made an acquisition of a, a Medicaid insurance company that's very was very diverse customer base. So there were very specific uh, reasons as to how, how it happened. Um, that we could point to but what that allowed us to do is less about the goal it became much less about the goal it became mm -hmm. about all the work that yeah. needed to be done because we had a more diverse customer base that we needed to serve through customer service that we needed to address clinically to um to close the disparities that we found um and then similarly when i joined this uh, my my current uh, organization this large hospital system i came at a ideal time because we were just building this new system there was uh, the merger of two large academic academic medical centers the beth israel and the Leahy, and then multiple community hospitals mm -hmm. uh the pandemic happened in between so there was a lot of work that uh, around strategy that didn't occur because everyone was busy with the, the obvious uh, pandemic but then once we got to a more stable point we then started building other uh, strategy which is uh, we call it blueprint blueprint 2030 um so by the year 2030, mm -hmm. we have specific goals and equity is one of those specific mm -hmm. goals that we've established. Okay. We have long-term aims, but then uh, uh, we have specific goals that align with those three pillars that I showed on that slide mm -hmm. around workforce, around our patients and around the community impact. A really long, long, long-term one. Deeper, I think yours is slightly different to that. Can you speak to, to us around that for a sec? Yeah, I think I think now I'm thinking again. Three is the magic number for us. I think it's two to three years for for um, the strategies that we set. And I think though, you know, it's really just important to stay agile. Mm -hmm. So you know, we see we're seeing a lot happening in the technology industry and many other industries. And so yeah. I think we just need to be able to to pivot and be agile and respond to what's happening in the world around us as well. Um, and, uh, you know, back, back to that point around enabling business, if we're able to demonstrate how a, you know, an agile strategy can support our business, um, then, you know, we're, we're all the more likely to be able to execute that successfully. So that's, that's, I think, for us, the kind of benchmark. Can I ask you a little bit more on that? So you, from, from our earlier discussions, and just, you know, keep, keep me honest here, you have a strategy, a top line strategy that then, and I think this is worth just flagging gives birth to plans for mm -hmm. is it was it your exact minus one exact minus two something along those lines can you just tell us a little bit about sort of how that that yeah. works yeah of course um so so we set our overall strategy and um 
I remember when I joined Pam Maynard, our CEO, and, and she's one of the few black women CEOs in tech, which um, we're really proud of. Um, but she she said, look, it's really great we're doing all this stuff, right? The execs are like, wow, you know, great webinar, but I want to see what you're actually doing about this. And so we created something called a commitment framework, which has more recently become the IND and wellbeing commitment framework. And essentially it helps to create transparency, uh, drive accountability and consistency around what our strategy is. So each of the 20 executive committee members has their commitment framework, which they should then be cascading throughout their organization um, yeah. to ensure that kind of everybody is aligned. Now, you know, and I said this to you before, uh, I'll be honest, if if you were to ask a um, mid-level manager at our organization, do they know exactly what's on the commitment framework of that executive? I couldn't guarantee that they do. And I think that, you know, a lot of that is based on the systems and structures around accountability that you have um, at organizations. But I think we're we're definitely working towards it. And we're, we're very aware of, you know, where the gaps are and what we need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm liking that sort of piece that, you know, we give them the framework and from that they drive the plan. I'll, I'll forgive you for the middle managers for a, for a while. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm, I, as I say, it's it, what in our experience, when we look at it and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll come to Ellen in a second, I'm sure she'll concur. You know, very often we look at organisations and they've got not really a strategy. There's a couple of grand statements, but there's no deep plan underneath to, to make it happen. And what pains me more is there's not a plan either. And if we're actually expecting people to make something happen, how the heck do we expect them to do it if they don't even know what our plan is, perhaps to overhaul processes or look at our HR systems or whatever? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want to answer I mean that. Absolutely. I mean, I would probably go even further and say, do we need a DNI plan or do we need DEI embedded in the business plans? Um, you know, I think that's where you're really going to start to achieve. You know, most people in DNI want to do themselves out of a job, and to do that, we need to make sure you know it's embedded. So, you know, your your business stakeholders are most important at the right time of the year to make sure that they're owning it, that it's reasonable for them, that they're behind it, and they're the ones who are going to deliver it, not you. Um, and yeah. only that way, I think, will the people below start to, to start to have knowledge of it as well and, and how it links to their role. Yeah, um, and um, sorry, sorry, can I just respond to that, Andrew, quickly? Um, I think, you know, Al, you're yeah, absolutely sure. right. It needs to be embedded into the business plans. I think what we've done by creating this commitment framework is because of that accountability there, we tell them as part of that framework that they need to make sure that they embed it or that they need to make sure when they have their all hands pulled, yeah. this is very much a part of it. And so maybe that's kind of a step before mm -hmm. and so that eventually we can remove the yeah. plan and you can just see their business plan with that embedded into it. So I, I completely Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And can I draw us, there's a, a brilliant question that, that that's um, that's coming in and everybody's very appreciative of, of the authenticity you're all, you're all sharing, but they want us to get a little bit more granular on actually how do you show the benefits of a DEI strategy um, with figures? So I know one you sort of touched on that. So I don't know. Can you sort of dig in a little bit yeah, on that? You know, uh, so if I know yeah. you're from the world of finance, so you're going to want to see those figures as much as hell. So tell us. Yeah. So I, I mentioned um, the previous. Uh, so for for any organization, I think the business case is 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 unique to that organization. So that's the first mm. point. Um, in, in the last employer, we made it very much about the customer. Uh, and sort of the customer acquisition and we could calculate exactly the top line revenue and how we could reduce medical costs to increase margin um, through that diversity lens. Um, part of a hospital system now and the uh, the business case is there, but it's slightly different. Uh, uh, it is uh, a lot of what we can very uh, specifically point to in terms of revenue um, in terms of okay. bottom line impact is related to addressing health disparities. And in the yeah. US, the um, healthcare delivery system is evolving. Um, there's a, a, a model that's been established over the past few years. Uh, now, as we move from paying for volume of visits to a hospital, a fee for service system, as has been known to a value-based system where quality is improved yeah. Um, and cost is managed uh, more efficiently, really? so, so it yeah. can be more affordable. Healthcare can be more affordable. 
So mm -hmm. in that evolution, and because I come from that knowledge of having worked in healthcare strategy and finance, uh, we're able to then incorporate equity and health equity into that movement. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is uh, pay, pay, payment for health equity improvement now in these, these new models. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're able to point to, for our system, as an example, right now, we're able to point to about 20 million worth of health equity incentives that if we can, if we can deliver on all the capabilities that were on that slide related to health equity, yeah, that then do. we could then bring 20 million worth per year worth of value. Thank for, you, winning. Uh, for the work. That's right. Yeah, that's brilliant. And and can I sort of stick with that? And there's a, there's a question here from from Erin. Um, and and again, I'm very always very big on what are the business results and how are you going to sort of line those up. But Erin's also, I'm quite rightly saying, you know, when we look at driving inclusive behaviours, what other I'm going to call them softer. I hate that word, but slightly softer measures. Do you use any of those to kind of prove that your strategy is working or linking it back up deeper? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, there's a few things that are coming to mind at the moment. Firstly, with regards to the organisation that I'm in, um, our clients are actually asking us about uh, inclusion, diversity, well-being as part of RFPs. Yeah. So we're actually able to provide what we're doing and that's helping us win business, which is which is great to see. Um, and secondly, I think, you know, I remember our, 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 Pam, our Pam, our CEO, Pam, talking to us about how we deliver value to our clients. And she was basically saying, well, if we have happy and motivated teams on our client sites, then that delivers value to our clients. That also gives us a good people management reputation. And how do we achieve that? We achieve that through a strong sense of inclusion, a strong sense of well-being as well. And so we talk about how inclusive behaviors actually enable high performance and thus enable us to you know, perform at our best. And so that's how we kind of make that connection on something quite specific. Excellent. And, and I know Elle's going to be chomping at the bit to talk about measuring that. So Elle, can you sort of enlighten us as to how on earth you would measure that and therefore have that potential measurement in your strategy? So those sort of improvements, what, what would you look at? I mean, I'd come back again to embedding it in your general performance measures. Um, I know Deeper and I have had this conversation a lot as well that, um, you know, you can achieve your your um, performance figures as much as you like, but you won't get the same rating unless you do so inclusively. And it's it's simple as that, because if it's not inclusive, then you are, as Deepa just said, distracting from the business costs in themselves. So it should be embedded in your performance indicators. But of course, your managers need to be equipped to understand how to identify what inclusive behavior looks like mm -hmm. and to understand how not to reward exclusive behaviors. So I think managers and performance are, are really your key because they're the ones often measuring your performance for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Al. And I'm, I'm going to actually sort of whoops, stick with you just for a second. Steph's asked a question that, again, is, I know, very close to 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 our hearts at GP Strategies DEI division, and she's asking what tactically she's using the word cascade. What does the cascade of the strategy look like? I'm going to wind in there accountability because for me, I can't cascade a strategy. I can't cascade a plan if I'm not holding anyone accountable for doing it. Um, and and I wonder if I can just stay with you out there for a, a minute. You know, what are some of the ways you talk there about sort of KPIs? But if you're not an organisation that's at the position to wind that into your performance at the moment, what what are some of the things that we can suggest that Steph does for holding accountable and driving that cascade? Well, I think, you know, as we've discussed, it, it should be embedded and that's the ideal. But I totally understand that for some people that might be further down your DEI strategy or plan. Um, and sometimes accountability is hard to cascade without awareness. And it sounds basic, but I think the stakeholder that's often not talked about very much um, is your comms division. Um, and how are people really aware of how they're being held responsible for their behaviors? Are they aware of the DEI initiatives that are happening and how that links to the business? Um, so I'd say, you know, comms is a huge part of it. We often leave that to managers, but I think it should be central. It should be coming from your CEO. It should be coming from your comms department. It should be part of everything that you communicate should have a an EDI 
element to it to try and connect that back to the business before you have those formal accountabilities in place. Um, Deep, I can see you nodding. Yeah, I think um, the point that I wanted to comment on is sometimes it's not possible to have that accountability systematically mm. embedded. Mm. You know, a workaround that we have, for example, at the moment is in our um, what we call forward story. So it's like our feedback tool. Um, mm. We don't have a section for inclusion or well-being. But what we do do is we tell our leaders that when you put your priorities together, you need to have a people priority. So that's happening at the higher levels. People are yeah. putting in a people priority, even though there's not a section for it, they know they need to do it, right? And so you can find workarounds as long as you get, you know, the right stakeholders like HR, for example, on board to understand that that needs to happen and then comms to cascade that message. Um, and then you continue to use data, right? Okay, so how many of these priorities actually have people in them um, while well, they don't? So what are we going to do about it? And and I would, uh, if oh, I yeah. could add, um, you know, uh, the cascading um, that I, as I have seen it work effectively is, yes, there's an HR component, but as you saw in the framework that I shared, there's, it needs to connect to the, to whatever business your organization is in. I'm in the healthcare delivery business. So the clinical aspects of the work have a DI component and there's an accountability matrix that we've established to improve health equity. Um, there's also a community where we do business. So there's a community impact component to it. So um, the HR is a key component, but I often don't even start with the HR aspect. I lead with the business. Um, in fact, our DI vision is to transform care, care delivery by dismantling barriers to equitable health outcomes. The second part of the statement is become um, the leading system to attract, retain, and develop diverse talent. But I feel like that piece comes if you're able to really genuinely connect your bottom line work to to the work, because then then it impacts everybody. You know, all 36,000 of our employees care about this, because part of what we do as an organization, as a business of care delivery. Yeah, and and can I um, just put it out there? You, we talked about the having um, your comms department as a stakeholder. Can I take us back up to that initial creation of a strategy? Who are the key stakeholders? Perhaps Deepa, can you talk to that to start with? Do, 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 I mean, do, does Deepa take herself off to a, a, a small office and hide out for a week and, and write her strategy? Or does she actually talk to other people about it? What's, who's, who do you need there? Who do you need? I think you need, uh back to what Juan said, right? You need to understand what the state of the business is at the moment. So you need to be able to speak with, you know, the regional leads, the area leads, the business leads. You also need to speak with legal teams because there's different, um, in a global organization, there's different kind of legal um, requirements and uh, legislation that has an impact, um, communications, I mean, the list could go on. I really feel like this is everybody's responsibility and you could connect this to absolutely every single role if you really mapped that out. But I, I think the ones that we've called out are really the critical ones. Okay. And, 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 and the, the ideal scenario, uh, in my humble opinion, is, is uh, there needs to be a seat at the table at the executive most level. Um, so the role I yeah. have, the, the honor of serving in the seat that I have the honor of being in is a C-suite level role that reports to the CEO and my colleagues are uh, the key stakeholders that are responsible for all this work. So legal, our general counsel is there, our chief, our chief financial officer, our chief clinical officer, our chief human resource officer, but you need to be at the table in all discussions, um, business related discussions, because there needs to be a DI lens to all of those, but then there needs to be also a DEI specific plan uh, and and by being the chief mm -hmm. DEI officer, you're able to then get input from all the key stakeholders to drive yeah. that forward and then to create the level of, of accountability because no single DEI officer can do it alone or DEI team can do it alone. It, it needs to be everyone who's got a piece of accountability and yeah. that work. Actually, actually, one that speaks really well to the comment that Susan's made um, in in the chats as well um she's talking about sort of the internal skeptic skepticism um on business financial growth that's sort of you know oh come on how are you going to prove it how are you really going to prove it um and i think if you've got those 
big tickets at the table that has built that strategy in the first place you know I'm not above when I'm advising um, CDOs I'm not above them saying go and get the CEO to talk to them about it because you know that's going to get them forward a lot faster than you are doing it because I do think sometimes if you are in HR if you are in DEI the business heads will listen to other business heads and I'm afraid twas ever thus I wish it wasn't but you know it, it's, it's what we see I would imagine even if you've come out of the business but it gives you a flying head start um, yeah. for sure um, can I just um, take us then on to a conversation that you know we had in our kind of prelim conversation and that's when you are in an organization that has a global DEI strategy and it's thrust upon to translate it either locally or regionally and what the issues are around that and you know when is a strategy not a strategy because if that's coming down at you and then you translate it into something that's right for your region Deepa can I start with you on that one yeah absolutely and if I can just make a quick comment on your last one yeah one of the tips one of the things that we do is we get our uh, executive leaders to have some skin in the game so we give them a specific responsibility related to our strategy so they feel like they need to do something they need to cascade that message to um to ensure that it succeeds because they're responsible without so, trying to give your game away can you give us an example of that or am i putting you too far in this yeah time? so i mean a, a very basic example could be our cfo being the uh, sponsor for a specific pillar or employee network right. and a, a, you know, a large That's scale one at that yeah. So they know that the employee networks need to get funding so that they can achieve what they need to achieve in their network and therefore yeah. it all kind of runs from there. Cool. Thank you very, very much. So your other bug there, the global yeah. and local. What does the global what... and local? I think, you know, just as a starting point, what we've really had to do is we we've had to have conversations with the regions and areas. We call them we call them areas and then it cascades into regions. Um because a lot of times when you talk about um, IND, it's a very US centric conversation. And we acknowledge that we couldn't just push larger concepts onto organization, uh, onto the region. So I'll give you an example, um, allyship. Allyship is a huge concept in, in our space, but actually when you translate that, it doesn't necessarily make sense in hierarchical cultures, for example, in Asia, where you can't speak up and stand up and step up if the person is your manager or someone more senior to you. And so you have to, when you build a strategy, I think that you have to um, uh, allow for some flexibility for it to make sense at the regional level. And so what we do back to those commitment frameworks is we have our strategy and we say, here are our non-negotiables and here is the stuff that you can flex on in terms of how you actually execute it at the regional level. And then we still have that accountability piece where they have to come back and share with the CEO and all of the other exec right. leaders what they've done to contribute to that overall strategy. Got it. Got it. I like that. I think the US thing's really, really interesting. I, I have to say, when, when we first started, I'm, I am sure that we got more work because of the English woman with the posh voice, uh, which is bad from the girl from the East End, really, um, than, than ever we would have done if we'd started off with, which we now have obviously a huge host of, of, of US folks working for us. We have, a, obviously now we've, um, we're with GP Strategies, we have a, a US head, head office, but I'm sure in the beginning, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, and if I can move on that one to one, and um, you know, I know that Beth Israel across the US, but it is quite similar, isn't it? You've got some communities there that are almost like dealing with different regions. Yeah, yeah. And we are uh, actually fairly regional. We're in the northeast um, of the U.S., but we have we're in two different states. Uh, Massachusetts is very progressive and uh, very liberal. Um, and then we have hospitals also in New Hampshire that is um, you know, much more conservative and um, it's a more homogeneous um, type of uh, demographic as well so uh, issues related to race ethnicity resonate really well uh, in Massachusetts uh, in in New Hampshire we kind of have to look at the I to several other lens lenses and, and and be very thoughtful about how we address issues related to race ethnicity uh, 
in due to I think some of the, some of the political backlash that that does exist across the country and and depending on which state you're operating in the, the yeah. approach it just needs to be tweaked um but you know I always think back to the fact that the work itself um is especially if you center it on on health equity because we're in because I'm in healthcare then there's no disputing <laughs> that we want to provide better care to all uh, mm -hmm. and, and all can be defined differently based on where you're doing business. So, uh, so that's the approach we've taken is let's just figure out what is the, the equity issue or the disparity that exists in a particular community in a particular state. And, and let's just and go with that approach that resonates. Yeah. Uh, and Juan, can I stay with you a sec? I've had a, a, a please. Can I ask? Do put your questions in. Do put them in chat. Put them in Q and A wherever you want to put them or, or your comments. Um, but if you can send them to everyone, unless you, I, I promise I won't share your name. How's that? Because um, I've had one come just to me that's um, asking one if you would just expand a little bit um, with what what's qu what's quoted here is the current state of DEI in the US and how that's affecting your strategy. I know Deeper spoke to the ability to have a strategy that can be agile i guess you're having to be pretty agile in in some of the states at the moment aren't you yeah yeah i mean i, I think uh everyone's aware from the around the around the world uh about uh, the recent supreme court decision in the u.s that uh now prohibits um colleges and universities uh that for a very long time have been able to use race conscious admissions as part of the criteria um uh, to increase diversity in, in colleges and universities. Um, so, you know, that, uh, that even though it only applies to colleges and universities, it, we do think it does have a ripple effect in terms of how uh, organizations hire. Uh, we, we knew that that was coming. Uh, I think everyone knows the makeup of, knew the makeup of the Supreme Court here. Uh, how conservative it is. Um, so knowing that it was coming, we had already prepared sort of how would we respond. And um, so what we did is we uh, reaffirmed our, our commitment to this work because the first question that people will ask is, are you still doing DE&I? <laughs> is it, or is that going to go away because of yeah. one decision? We also, um, and I shared the slide that had 17 capabilities. Only one of those capabilities relates to hiring. Uh, there so there's and we're still going to do that but there's many other uh air aspects of the eni that we will continue to advance uh in spite of uh some of the backlash or some of the recent um issues that we're confronting so right. so the point being is there's, there's just so much work work to do it our the di strategies need to be comprehensive so that not a, yeah, a single decision by supreme court or or a single component of the strategy is, is uh, disrupts everything else. So you can still drive the work across many other dimensions. Thank you very much. And um, Elle, can we just touch on, I know you have something to say on this topic around Asia. I know Deepa began that, just a, a quickie. For, uh, I doubt we've got anyone on from Asia at this time, but they may well be watching the recording. So um um, I would just say you know, that there are probably many, many of us who are thinking about global strategies, and sometimes you can feel the pressure of having to be a cultural expert on every culture in the world, and you need to know your data, you need to know your benchmarks, you need to know the diversity of your organization in that region, but don't forget one of your big stakeholders are your people, you know, ask them how um, your global strategy feels to them there and what should change. Um, so, you know, talk talk to the people on the ground. Um, and, you know, certainly from a GP perspective, we are receiving a lot of requests of new interest from Asia at the moment. I think people often think that the US is driving things. DEI is huge in Asia at the moment. There are lots and lots of new reports coming out. There was one a couple of weeks ago by Deloitte that I think it was 70% of people feel that DEI initiatives are one of the most important things when they are applying for a job. Um, and the other thing I would say about Asia is that people get very afraid, afraid of the LGBTQ plus issue in Asia and, of course, know your data, know the law. Um, but the same report said more than 50 percent of LGBTQ plus in Asia, people in Asia feel comfortable being out in your organization. So, again, mm -hmm. talk to your people. Don't feel you need to be experts, but know your data.
Thank you very, very much, Al. Uh, Deeper, I'm going to stick you right on the spot for a question that's come in, if I may. Um, yeah. and the benefits of DEI strategy to retention and engagement. So, I mean, for tell, just tell me what I'm going to cascade you back up again. So retention and engagement, your strategy is sitting here. What what links do you make for those things? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the pillars of our strategy is around creating a culture where inclusion and well-being is embedded and people feel like they can be their best at work and therefore do their best at work. We actually have um, a employee listening survey that goes out um, at periodically, which actually captures um, engagement as well as inclusion and well-being scores. And so it's really interesting to see the very strong correlation between engagement and inclusion. And then we can look at that from, you know, cutting that from an intersectional data perspective as well. So um, I think that that's a really interesting um, way for us to tell the story about why this is really important. Um, and then of course, when you look at wellbeing and you look at things like absences and, you know, long, long, long leaves of absences um, and sick time and all of that, there's just so much good data out there that you can use to tell this story. So look, we're nearly at the top of the hour. I, I, I can, if I may, try hard to sum up. I mean, I think we 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 really are saying the big tenants are for goodness sake, link it to your business strategy, and you know, and tell the story. I, that's the other thing I've heard from all of you, um, probably one especially, but the, that storytelling around linking it to the business strategy. It's not bullet points. It's a, a beautiful embroidered quilt, really, of a story um, that links why we're doing what we're doing. I think it's having the right stakeholders at the top in terms of both that strategy, but also the right stakeholders through the business as you're building that strategy. I'm, I'm loving hearing that. I heard from all of you, and thankfully not just Elle, um, around measurement and data, um, but she managed to, to, to get that in. And, and again, for me, it's very much around the accountability piece. I think, you know, it's a journey to accountability. If you can't straight away link it to KPIs, at least there needs to be a management accountability for a conversation that says, what are you doing to drive inclusion? Um, and show me the evidence that you're, you're doing it at every level of the business. But before I let my wonderful panel go, um, top tips people what what would you say to the folks out there what are the kind of top things that you would like to just leave them with um today in terms of that perhaps one can i start with you yeah i'm just uh gonna be a broken record and say uh develop that business case for your organization uh and there's the capital uh letter business case kind of the for for uh, the more macro level, but then any initiative that you're developing, I think requires kind of a lowercase business case to just okay. be able to engage more of your stakeholders as to the why behind the work. And and there's, you know, there's a very tactical approach to both the moral case as well as the business or economic imperative behind the work and, and always lead with both but know that some people are driven by one more than the other. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Deeper. Um, I think it's back to the understanding the local um, nuances, local and cultural nuances as you're building your strategy and just being very aware of that and demonstrating when you're sharing it that you have built in flexibility because you understand those nuances. Very, very much. And the other thing I'll breathe onto that, if I may, is build it for them, not you. I've seen an awful lot of strategies that have got stuff in there that actually the head of DEI wanted to put in there rather than the stuff that actually worked for the business. Mm. And last, but by no means least, come on in, Elle, what's your tip? I would say know what drives behaviour in your organisation. So, you know, is it fun? Do you need to have activities that, I can't believe I'm saying this as a data-driven person, that are more fun related or is it financially driven? Because at the end of the day, DI is really about changing behaviour. Thank you. Look, I can't say more than one deeper elf and everybody out there. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you further at GP Strategies DEI Division. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organisations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies resource library. The link is on your screen and in the description.